I have enjoyed the fantastic singing that we have engaged in together. I've enjoyed the wonderful fellowship and the food, the delicious food that you have uh, so willingly provided for us throughout this series. And not only that, the outstanding gospel sermons that we have heard throughout this weekend and pointing out some of the most important things that we have to think about and deal with in our lives. Many of the things that we have talked about throughout the weekend have been on equal levels of importance, but the thing is, the most important thing in the whole world. And as we end this afternoon, I think that we have found it. As we end this afternoon, we're thinking about the one most important thing in the whole entire world, and the answer is preparing to leave this life. That's the one thing. The one important thing that we have to do. You know, one of the greatest passages in the book of Job has to do with man's last day upon the earth. In fact, Job 14, 14 says, If a man die, shall he live again? Job says, All of the days of my appointed time will I wait till my change comes. He looks at the things of nature like the trees and he realizes that some of the things could live again. As he looks at the trees, he says there's a hope of a tree, verse 7, if it be cut down, then it will sprout again, that the tender branch thereof will not cease. But it seems like that there is no hope for man. You look at verse 10 and he says, but man dies and wasteth away. Yea, man giveth up the ghost and where is he? We can't see them. As the waters fail from the sea and the flood decays and dries up, so man lies down and rises not till the heavens be no more. They shall not awake nor be raised out of their sleep. He says, it seems like, I'm looking all around, I'm looking at nature, and yes, it seems like that, that there is no hope for a man, but I do understand that I'm going to wait till the heavens be no more, and, and then what is going to happen, he says, be raised out of sleep. That's when he says, our change will come. Verse 14. Job held on to the fact that this life is not the end. There will be something more. There will be a change that takes place one day. We can call it the very last day. And how important is it to be prepared for that very last day? It's the most important. The most important thing we can ever do. Brethren, I say that flesh and blood shall not inherit the kingdom of God, neither corruption shall inherit incorruption. Behold, I show you a mystery, Paul says, we shall not all sleep. We're not all going to die before Jesus comes again, but we shall all be changed, he says, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and he says... We shall be changed. Why? This mortal must put on immortality. This corruptible must put on incorruption. 1 Corinthians 15, 50 through 53, that's at that time when our vile bodies will be changed, fashioned like unto his glorious body, Philippians 3 and verse 21. What Paul was telling us and Job was telling us is the very same thing that Jesus told us when he said, Marvel not at this, the hour cometh into which all that are in the graves shall hear his voice and shall come forth. They that have done good to the resurrection of life, they that have done evil to the resurrection of damnation. What were they saying? They were saying there's coming a day when all will be raised, all will be changed, and all will go into eternity somewhere forever. It's our God, the high and lofty one, 
who inhabits eternity, Isaiah 57, 15. We look forward to being with him. We look forward, as David said, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever, Psalm 23, 6. I'm interested then in what happens in this life, but I'm interested also in what's going to happen into the next life, and I have to be prepared for that. I have to prepare for that now. I want you to turn to Revelation chapter 20. There are three things here that we've got to understand from Revelation chapter 20. Knowing that this is truly the most important thing in the whole entire world, making sure that we're prepared to leave this world for three different reasons found here in Revelation 20, beginning in verse 11. The first reason is this. Why is it the most important thing for us to be prepared to leave this world? Because we will stand before the eternal throne of God. Look at verse 11. I saw, John says, a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were open. And another book was open, which is the book of life. We're going to stand before this throne. John says, I saw a great white throne. It was white because the one sitting on it is holy and pure. It is a great throne. Why? Because it's above every other, other throne that you can name. No human authority is greater than the Lord's authority. It's great. Think about all the passages in the New Testament over and over and over. It is emphasized that we will stand before the judgment seat of Christ. We're all going to stand there before his throne, Romans 14 and verse 10. And, and he says, as I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, every tongue shall confess to God. So then every one of us shall give account of himself to God, verses 11 and 12. I remember 2 Corinthians 5, 10. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone, you and me, will receive the things done in his body according to that you have done, whether it's good or bad. Bad. I remember how Paul told Timothy, 1 Timothy 4 and verse 1, when he said, I charge thee therefore before God and our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom. I remember how Acts 17, 31 says, God has appointed a day in the which he will judge the world by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, and that he raised him from the dead. We're going to be judged. Judged by our Lord. On that last day, we'll stand before the great white throne. We'll see our Lord in all of his glory. We'll see how radiant and, and consuming he is. In fact, John says, when I saw him, the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. Everything will be gone. See, the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise. The elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up, 2 Peter 3.10. And every single person, you and me, and everyone who will ever set foot upon this earth will witness this wonderful, glorious day. Notice he says, he saw the dead small and great. We might say those who are well known, those who are not so well known. I know that Jesus mentioned in Matthew chapter 11, beginning in verse 20, as he began to denounce all those cities where most of his mighty works were done because they would not repent. He mentions Tyre. He mentions Sidon. And he says they would have repented long ago if they had seen the things done in Carasa and Bethsaida and Sodom would even still be here if they had seen the miracles like the people saw in Capernaum. But he says it's going to be more tolerable for them than for you. 
And you're talking about people who were separated by time, people who were separated by place. Sodom existed 19 centuries before Jesus, now located most likely where the Dead Sea is currently located. Tyre and Sodom, ancient Philistine cities on the coast of the Mediterranean Sea. You've got him mentioning Nineveh, the capital of Assyria, hundreds of miles northeast of Palestine. All of them live before the cross. All of them live before the time of Jesus, but he says all of them will be in judgment. Everybody from Adam to me to the very last person who breathes on this planet small and great will be there that's why it's the most important thing in the whole world to be prepared for that great day. But secondly, John tells us the reason why this is the most important thing is because we're all going to be judged by eternal books. You look here at verses 12 and 13 where he sees those dead, small and great, standing before God. And the books are open, he says. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. He tells us how the sea gave up the dead which were in it. And death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged, every man, according to their works. Notice that they were judged by their works. <coughs> Those books that he mentions, the, the books are open. We might say, what kind of books will be open on that day? Well, there's a book that we are all writing. You're, you're writing a book right now in your life, Ecclesiastes 12.14. Ecclesiastes 12.14 shows us that God's going to bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, everything you're writing in your life. It's like writing a book before God. But what about, what about this wonderful book right here? Will it be open? Yes. Jesus himself said, He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my word hath one that judgeth him the word that I have spoken. The same shall judge him in the last day. We're going to be judged by these, this eternal book. And, and you think about the other book that he mentions here that's going to be open. It's the book of life. Now you go over to Luke chapter 10 and you see how that Jesus sends out the 70 disciples out two by two into every city where he would go. And he tells them to go out and to heal the sick that are therein and say unto them, The kingdom of God is come nigh unto you, but in whatsoever city you enter and they receive you not, go your ways out into the streets of the same. And say, Even the very dust of your city which pleads on us, we do wipe off against you. Notwithstanding, be sure of this, that the kingdom of God is come nigh unto you. Now, it thrilled the 70 when they returned. As Jesus said, I'm giving you power to tread on serpents, verse 19, and scorpions, and over all of the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Notwithstanding in this, he says, rejoice not that the spirits are subject unto you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. He says, I know that it is thrilling here to, to and an honor to work these great miracles and, and to use your talent and your influence as they return with joy saying, hey, even the demons are subject to us. And Jesus says, what you need to be concerned with is that your names are written in heaven. That symbolic book, that book of life that, that the Bible speaks about, Philippians 4 and verse 3, a record of all of the redeemed. Based upon the fact that in these ancient cities, what happened was they would take a 
register and they would write the names down of all of the citizens in that city so that the families would be known and that the inheritance could be preserved only when a person died or when that person a person lost his citizenship his rights as a citizen that's when the name would be blotted out you don't want your name blotted out You don't want to lose your citizenship in heaven, Philippians 3.20. See, Jesus spoke to the church at Sardis and he said, if you overcome, you're going to be clothed with white raiment and I will not blot his name out of the book of life, Revelation 3.5. That's where we want to be. We want to overcome Satan. We want to overcome the world. How? Faith is the victory. That's what we see. First John 5, 4. John sees how the sea gave up the dead which were in it. And he says, death and Hades delivered up the dead which were in them. Death has claimed the bodies of men and Hades has claimed the souls of men. And on this last day, what happens? Death? No more. Their death is going to give up. It's going to release those bodies. And what happens? Hades, it's going to release the, the souls that have, that have been held captive there. And on the last day, God is going to open up. He's going to open up that book. He's going to open up the book of life. He's going to hold the book that we're writing up against the, the word. You know, on that day our Lord could say, you know, <clears throat> I said, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Did you do that? He could open up his book and say, you know what? I told you to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Did you put the church first in all things in your life? He could open up his book and say, you know, I told you not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together as the matter of some is. Did you forsake worship assembly times? He could open up his book and say, I told you not to be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, Romans 12, too. Did you do that? He could open up his book and say, I, I told you that you needed to take the gospel out into the world and to teach others so that they can teach others and they can teach others, 2 Timothy 2, 2. Did you do that? He might open up his book and say, I told you to be kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you, Ephesians 4, 32. Did you show that? This is the most important thing in the whole world. Being prepared to leave this life because we will be before that great white throne. Number one, we will stand there and be judged by those eternal books. Number two, and number three, notice this, we will enter eternity. John, what did you see? Verses 14 and 15. And death and hell, that's Hades, were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. We're going to have one of two places to be for all eternity. You make the choice. It'll be heaven or it'll be death. It'll be that eternal life or it'll be eternal death. Eternal joy or eternal fire. We, we make that choice and we do that right now. Eternal life is all about glory and, and honor and immortality. Romans 2 and verse 7. Jesus said, I'm going to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. And receive you myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Remember, he said, in my Father's house are many mansions. Everywhere I saw, I would have told you. 
John 14 and verse 2, you think about those many mansions. Literally, what he was talking about is basically saying, hey, there's plenty of room there. In the ancient world, the eastern world, the patriarch of the family, he would have a large house, and in that house he would have many different rooms in it that would be adequate for all of his children, all of his grandchildren, and he'd bring them all in. And that is the idea that Jesus uses to say, there's plenty of room in my father's house. that is prepared, prepared by our Lord, and you can too. Peter says it's an inheritance, incorruptible and undefiled, and that fades not away, reserved in heaven for you, 1 Peter 1, 4. John sees it. He sees it in chapter 21 when he says, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. The first heaven and the first earth were passed away. There was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven. Look at it. Prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband. He describes heaven as beautiful as that bride on her wedding day. New gown, new hair. Makeup. All of that focus on that one special person. And that's what John says heaven is for us. I haven't heard a voice, he says, saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. As in the Old Testament, when the Ark of the Covenant was there inside of the tabernacle, it was representative of, of God dwelling among them, Psalm 80 and verse 1. And now he says, hey, God is going to be with you. You can dwell with him. You're going to be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. And I want you to see what happens because of this close relationship. Verse 4, God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. There shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain. For the former things are passed away. Every single sad tear that you have ever shed will be no more in that wonderful place called heaven. I know that most of the tears that we shed have to do with death. Most of the tears that we shed have to do with sin in some way, but in heaven, it won't touch us. We get peace. Preparing for that great and final judgment day. Preparing for the glories of heaven. We get peace. There's no more separation there. There's everlasting life, John 3, 36. No more sin. No more slips of weakness. Do you have those? I do. No more shortcomings in your life. No more times when you, you, you spend so much time crying at, at funeral homes and so and in the homes of family and friends, you, you won't have to do that anymore. But on the other hand, there's eternal punishment. It's all about destruction. It's all about perishing and departing we like. It's all about darkness, the blackness of darkness forever, Jude 13. Can you imagine a darkness like that? One where you, I imagine, one where you cannot even see your hand right there in front of your face. I've been in situations like that before. Do you want to be like that for all eternity? Jesus said it's a place where the worm dies not and the fire is not quenched, Mark 9, 44. You've seen maggots eating decayed things. And that's the disgusting picture that Jesus paints. 
He could look at the valley of Hinnom, literally there in Jerusalem, a place that was a garbage dump, a place that was continually burning with fire because they would throw their dead animals there. They would throw their garbage there. They would throw dead bodies there. And you could see the, the maggots crawling all through there. You could smell Where their worm dieth not. It's a disgusting picture of those, those maggots eating that rotting and, and, and decayed things. And, and you think about spiritually speaking, the wicked will not die. Why? Because, because this spiritual decay will last forever. The most important thing in the whole world is 
is preparing to lead this life. Ask yourself now, am I prepared? Am I prepared to lead this life? Because if I'm not, I better make preparations now while I'm alive, while I have time. I better redeem the time because the days are evil and are not getting any better, Ephesians 5 and verse 16. I better repent of my sins. I better put them out of my life, Luke 13, 3. I better confess Jesus as the Christ, Romans 10, 10. I better be baptized for the forgiveness of my sins, Acts 2, 38, so that I can live faithfully to him unto death and receive the wonderful reward that's waiting for the faithful Revelation 2.10. If you have a need this afternoon, 